Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to the ARCO Forum. The Institute of Politics is delighted to present tonight's uh, program, which is called Politics, Politicians, and Power in Washington, D.C. And the two people that we have here to speak to us tonight, of course, are well equipped to tackle this topic. Yeah, Both served time in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Both were recently released from confinement in Washington, D.C. Both have published books about their experiences, and both have appeared together, of course, recently in a telev television program uh, that has become quite popular called The Long and the Short of It. It is my particular pleasure to welcome back to the Kennedy School of Government the Honorable Robert Reich. And honorable is more than an appropriate title, and for two reasons. First, because in the common sense of the word, it is well deserved by this gentleman. And secondly, because by American tradition, we give that title to every elected official in America, as well as ever, every appointed high government official, uh, except those that end up in prison, of course. Currently, Robert Reich is a professor at Brandeis University. As everyone knows, he most recently served four years as the Secretary of Labor during the first term of President Clinton. And by any objective standard, he accomplished a great deal there. But by his own standard, I suspect he considers it not enough. He was a close friend of both the President and the First Lady. And he had served in several positions in Washington during the, the, the administrations of President Ford and President Carter. And as I already indicated, he was here at the Kennedy School prior to becoming Secretary of Labor uh, as a member of the faculty. Uh, I learned about his popularity when I inherited his old office. And on that floor discovered that he was revered as a very popular and very effective teacher, known for his clarity, his wit, and his passion, all of which I think uh, anyone who's looked at his book will recognize uh, comes through. Uh, but also by the staff that worked in that hallway, they made it very clear to me how much they respected him and what standard the rest of us had to aspire to. He is the author of seven books. Uh, one of his best knowns and most effective was The Work of Nations. And of course now he is the author, he has a new book out called Locked in the Cabinet by Robert Reich, which by the way, The New Yorker has decided to excerpt this week. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Reich. Uh, well, Phil, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I want to, right off the, the bat, I want to clear up something, and that is that I did not design the cover of my book. Uh, it is the most immodest. I mean, somebody came up to me and said, why did you name a book Robert B. Reich? And I, and I said, I said I didn't. Now, how, how many people can actually read the title of this book? Anybody, can you, just put up your hand. This is a, I'm, I'm interested if you can read the title. The title is not Robert B. Reich. You, can you read the title? You can read the title. Nobody, you can't read the title. This is called Locked in the Cabinet. <laughs> Just remember that. It's not Robert, it's Locked in the Cabinet. Now, I thought that tonight, the, the, what would be useful, I've been asked, I, I've been on, the last couple of days, been doing something that uh, I have done in the past with books when they are published. I've engaged in the humiliation ritual called uh, touring with one's book, going on a book tour, uh, that is uh, talking on radio and on television about, about your book. And uh, people ask questions, and one of the most interesting questions that I have got, quite frankly, is of the things that you learned this past tour of duty in Washington, what were the kinds of things that you never taught about, you never taught when you taught public management at Harvard? In other words, how would you teach it differently? What did you learn that you did not know before? And that question actually caught me unprepared because I, I, I could have and I should have thought about that question ahead of time. I had been in Washington in the 1970s, as Phil said, so Washington was not completely new to me, but I did learn a few things. And in the very limited amount of time we have together, I want to give you two lists two lists of learning. Uh, the first one I actually published 
And uh, it's not, it's really a bunch of precepts that was given to me, and I'll go over them very, very quickly. It, it, it occurred, th this particular learning episode uh, occurred when I was in an airport, and the person who was my aide, who was my advance person, which is the person who is helping me go from place to place, the guardian of the bubble, making sure that nobody gets to me. The public doesn't actually have a chance to talk to me or me to the public. Uh, this person came up to me uh, very reluctantly, a young man who had been in several political campaigns and had been an advanced, advanced person for several people, and he said, you know, Mr. Secretary, I, there are some things that you need to learn about being a muck. And I said, well, what, what do you mean? Uh, and he said, uh, you're not acting like a muckety-muck. You're, no, you you're not acting like you ought to act as Secretary of Labor. You're a little bit, well, if you don't mind me saying so, uh, you're a little shabby. <laughs> well, I, I actually, he, he gave me 10 rules. Now, these are things that I, I don't think are the most important things that I, I learned. I will get to that in just a moment. But I very quickly, if you don't mind, uh, me just going through these. This is a little private reading we have of my book. Uh, it's shameless, but let me just read this to you. <laughs> the ten rules of muckdom. Uh, first, and this is for cabinet officers or above, it may apply to other people, but this is particularly for high government officials. First, you must immediately hand off all briefcases, luggage, tote bags, and carry-alls. A muck doesn't carry bags. A muck's arms always swing freely. You understand, he asked me. I think so, I said. Now, good. Now, second, he said to me. Now, the, see, you see, the thing is, I had been, I had been carrying these heavy briefcases. This, this is what prompted his... The second, he said, now, you must go directly through doorways without waiting for others to go first. A muck doesn't stop at thresholds and say, after you. That's non-muck. And I say, okay, I'll try. And he began warming to his subjects, and he was, he was a wonderful fellow. He said, now watch me. The third principle is you walk quickly with head held high and back straight. A muck doesn't dawdle or wait for others to catch up. A muck always looks like he's late for a meeting with the president. <laughs> Fourth, always wear suits that are pressed, shirts freshly cleaned and pressed, shoes that are shined. A muck should look like a muck. Uh, if you'll excuse me for saying so, sir, you need a little spiffing up. That's what he said. Uh, and then he said, number five, get in the camera shot. No use looking like a muck if they don't see you. There's one exception, which I'll get to in a moment. And then he sat down. He, he asked me if I wanted to write any of this down. And I said, no, I'll remember it. And I really did remember it. I wrote it all down that evening. He said, six, when you're invited to give a speech, always arrive in the nick of time. Uh, better yet, be a few minutes late. A muck doesn't wait around in holding rooms. A muck lets his host worry just a bit. <laughs> now, you see, I didn't do that tonight. I was here at 6 o'clock. Uh, uh, seventh, when you're finished speaking, don't sit down at the head table. You'll have to listen to the other speakers. A muck doesn't listen to other speakers unless they outrank him. <laughs> Leave immediately or work the room and then exit quickly. Uh, eighth, eighth, when you work a room, spend no more than five seconds per handshake. Big donors get about 10. Grab their hand before they grab yours so that you are in control of the grip and can quickly move on. Make eye contact, but maintain peripheral vision so you know where you're heading. Uh, ninth, when walking in public with a president or vice president, trail slightly behind them, even if they are talking to you. When they're making a speech, stand behind and to the side and always look as though you're interested in every word. Never get in their camera shot. A muck always shows respect to higher mucks. <laughs> and tenth, the tenth and final rule of muckdom is the most important, he said. Whenever in public, in an airport, on the street, wherever, always look cool. Don't frown, don't clown, don't be down. A true muck is always in charge. Now, I tried to learn, learn those, uh, and, and then I, I told him here that I'll take all this to heart. Uh, he said, don't worry, you'll be in the cabinet for years, you'll get the hang of this, and then you'll face the hardest challenge of all, he said. And I asked him, what was that? He said, unlearning it when you leave the cabinet. <laughs> and then he giggled. 
I am proud to say after just a few months of not being in the cabinet, as you can see from the way I'm dressed, I have learned how not to be a muck, and I am determined to demuck myself. But let me, that is only half facetious. There are codes of conduct that I never fully understood, even when I was in government before. Uh, Ken Sane, who is my advance man, put it uh, quite boldly and baldly. Uh, but let me be serious for a moment and talk about things that I really did learn uh, and that I never taught before. I'm not sure they can be taught, but I will list them for you. And these are the serious rules uh, of being a cabinet secretary or being a high government official in the executive branch. I'd, I'd be interested in hearing from uh, my comrade in arms, my co-conspirator Al Simpson, whether he feels that these are also applicable to the legislative branch. They have to do with survival. And the first and most important rule is have a sense of humor. Maintain a sense of humor. Find something to laugh at every day, and particularly laugh at yourself. There is a seriousness that overwhelms Washington and other capitals, a kind of self-important, syrupy seriousness that enables people to be amok, but makes it very difficult for them to see humor in what they are doing. And I try very, very hard, always, to find a little bit of humor, self-deprecating humor, Secondly, separate yourself from the job. Remember always that the job is over here and you and your identity are different from that job. You have to do that, or otherwise you get hurt. It can be very painful. Uh, no matter how thin a skin or thick a skin you have, if you don't understand that they are attacking the job or they're attacking the secretary of labor or whatever they're doing, or they're praising that person who is in that office, not you. Keep your sense of distance. Keep your sense of personhood. Uh, it's a glamorous temp job, being a cabinet secretary. And you have to, and I had to remind myself that I was going home. I would go home. We kept our house here in Cambridge so that I knew at any time I could go home. I was not dependent on Washington. Uh, and thirdly, and this is quite serious, and it parallels what Ken Sane told me in terms of rules of muckdom, it's important to salute, to make sure that you maintain a certain humility, to salute not only your superiors, president and also vice president, but also respect people, respect people in Congress. I remember in my congressional preparation for my congressional hearing, my nomination and, and confirmation hearing, I was told by my preparers, and I get into this in the book, that I was not supposed to answer every single question that people asked me. Uh, I was supposed to, in fact, the purpose of a confirmation hearing is not necessarily to answer every question. Uh, the purpose of a confirmation hearing is to show respect and not fool people into thinking you respect them, but to actually uh, tell them that you will enjoy working with them. You hope to work with them. You are a member of the executive branch. Uh, you have to share power. And it's important that there be that mutual sense of respect across party lines. And number four, it is very, very important. If you're going to survive in this climate, in this Washington especially, you must believe in what you are doing and saying. There has to be that sense of total, if not total, at least clear commitment. Because if you're not sure that you care or you believe in what you are saying and doing, people will pick up on it. Your enemies, your opponents, the press, others will pick up on it. Survival is very often a, dependent on having a set of principles and values and sticking with those principles and values. They may disagree, others, but they will come to respect your sincerity. I hope that occurred with me. Number five, hire people who are not like you. There is a tendency, particularly among people at higher reaches of government, it's probably a tendency throughout government and elsewhere, to hire people who are like you. You're comfortable with people who are like you. You know, if, if somebody came up to me, wanted to be my chief of staff or my deputy, and they looked like me, they were about four foot ten, and they had my sense of humor, 
and they came from uh, New England, and they went to fancy Ivy League colleges all their lives. I would probably, if I didn't think about it, I'd say, oh, what a, what a terrific person. Uh, what a, oh, I just, I love this person. <coughs> but it's very important to hire people, particularly, in my case, a deputy, a chief of staff, who were nothing like me. I wanted to make sure that they were competent, obviously very skilled, and I did a lot of phoning around to get people who were wonderful, but they were totally different from me. They, 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 their, their personalities, their aspirations, their backgrounds, their education, their, their perceptions, they shared my values, but they were very, very different, very different in many, many ways. It made for some very amusing times, but I learned a lot from them. That You see, they didn't share my weaknesses, they didn't share my strengths, and they were willing to tell me over and over again when I was making mistakes, when I was making mistakes. And that brings me to another point. Number six, allow yourself to be managed. Now, I did not like being managed. I, I, I wanted, I, I, I resented people telling me where I had to be and when I had to be. And, and most people who are in the cabinet, most people who are sub-cabinet officials, I, I went to actually reach, there's a three by five index card you carry around that has on it every 15 minute interval where you are going to be from 7 a.m. to about 10.30 at night. And there are people to make sure that you are where you are supposed to be. And this index card gets adapted and changed during the day. And there are three people preparing this index card for me every day. And there is one person who is doing nothing but preparing a briefing book that reaches me at 10 o'clock in the night to prepare me, and I spend two hours on it, spent two hours on it, prepare me for the next day's schedule. And you can see, there. so there are a whole team of people who are managing me and managing my time. And I get to the end of a 15 or 20 minutes, and there is somebody who says, you must move on, Mr. Secretary, you must move on. Abdication of all responsibility. And I resented it. And one day, I, I was so resentful, this was early on, that I escaped from my office through a back office door. And I felt very mischievous. And I went down the hallway in the Department of Labor and I, and I explored places in the department that no Secretary of Labor had ever been. <laughs> and I met people in the mail room and I met people and, and custodial staff and I went into elevators and I went to the far reaches, the Siberia reaches of the Labor Department and I talked to people, it's marvelous. But you can imagine what happened in the front office. Secretary missing. It was like the warden finding that the inmates had got out. They, they, sent, they, sent, uh, they sent security people all over, dashing, where is the secretary? All a, a four alarm alert, he is missing. Now, the problem I got into, uh, quite honestly, is that I got lost. <laughs> I had intended to come back, but I, the, 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 part, the building is so complicated and so big, I didn't know where I was. And I did get lost, and I was so thankful that somebody finally did come and rescue me and took me back to my prison cell, to my bubble. Uh, and I remember Kitty Higgins, who was my chief of staff, wonderful, wonderful woman, she scolded me. She said, you shouldn't do that, it's dangerous. <laughs> and I said, dangerous? This isn't Bosnia, this is the Department of Labor, Kitty. Why, what are you talking about? Dangerous? She said, no, it's dangerous because you don't know where you could be. We need to get you, the president may need to get you. You have to, you have to be managed. We'll talk to you about where you're supposed to be. You have some say in this, but you've got to play the game as it's supposed to be played. You might even get lost in this building. <laughs> and I, I denied, I denied it. But I, in the book, I admit that I did get lost and she'll have her last laugh. Uh, another point, and I'm getting to the end of my points here, but another point, point number seven, never be cowed by inanimate objects. Now, what do I mean by that? Very often in the position of cabinet secretary, someone will say to you very sternly, the White House wants you to go to, go to Cleveland. And I remember uh, for the first year, I'd say, oh, yeah, well, the White House wants me to go. I'd go to Cleveland. <laughs> but, but it struck me uh, about 10 months in, 11 months, that there were a lot of inanimate objects that were directing me to do things. <laughs> Congress is very unhappy. <laughs> and I would begin asking, well, who in the White House wants me to go to Cleveland? Or, or, or who in the Sen among Senate Democrats are unhappy? Give me specifics. 
And if somebody in the White House under 30 wants me to go to Cleveland, I want to know. I want to know. And, I, and, I, and from that point on, there was a little bit more dis discussion about whether I would do things. Because inanimate objects, there are no inanimate objects that have feelings. Even Wall Street doesn't really have feelings. There are people there. Uh, number eight, get out of town. And I got out of town a lot. About one or two days a week, I left Washington and went out to talk to real people, real people. In, in stores, department stores and retail stores and factories. I went down in coal mines. I went to farms and just talking to people. Now, it's true I did have a security guard with me, and I usually had an advanced person, but I tried to get people to open up just a little bit. And most, mostly, they were a little intimidated. I mean, who is this short, at that time I had a beard, bearded person claiming to be a secretary of labor, and why is he here? And, but I did have some very good conversations with people, and it was very important for me to reality test, to actually find out what it was people were thinking about. Washington can be an echo chamber. It is so insular, so self-important. Get out, get out. Number nine, beg, beg for constructive criticism. People who work for you in these kinds of jobs they want to say to you all the time, that was brilliant. Mr. Secretary, that speech was absolutely insightful and extraordinary. People loved it. Oh, that television performance, Mr. Secretary, you've never been better. That, I, was, I was on the edge of my seat. That was so good. All of this disgusting, sycophantic, sticky, gluey, awful stuff. Washington is, is, just, is just drowning in it. It's like, it's like thick honey. And it's all baloney. And what you have to do, what you have to do, is not only not believe it, but you need to find people who will tell you the truth and tell you, and give you criticism, give you constructive criticism. It's not just you were lousy or you were tell, but give you constructive criticism, sincere criticism. And those people are worth their weight in gold. And I found them in the Department of Labor. Again, my deputy and my chief of staff were terrific. And I would often close the door and said, well, what's, what did I really do? And they would let me have it. You've got to have people who tell you the truth, tell you the truth. And finally, number 10, you've got to know when to go home. Now, I decided to go home, and it was very difficult for me. I decided about a week before the presidential election. And I went home because I have two teenage boys who I love, a wife who I dearly love, and those teenagers grow up so fast. I don't know how many of you either have them or have had them or were a teenager once. <laughs> if you were, you probably don't realize this. I didn't until I was a parent of a teenager. They, they are growing beside, be almost, almost daily. That You watch them, they change. And I only have boy teenagers. I don't know what it's like to be a parent of a girl teenager, but a boy is like a clam. It opens up and then closes. They open and close. And if you're not there when they open, you know, forget this quality time crap. It's a matter of just being Been there. With me too long. It's, just a, <laughs> it's just a matter of being there when they're there. And here I was. I was, I was commuting. My wife had come back. She had a two-year leave from her law school. She was back here in Boston with the boys. And I was commuting every weekend and feeling very proud of the fact that I was commuting and I had two days. I, I just carved out Saturday and Sunday and I was here with the family, but I wasn't with them. I wasn't with them. I wasn't seeing them grow. I wasn't, and I was desperately afraid that I wasn't going to be a father to them. And as we got one week before the election, I knew that chances were extremely high that Bill Clinton was going to be reelected, and he wanted me to stay, and I had to make a decision. And I decided to leave the job that was the best job I ever had in my life. I will never, I am absolutely sure of it, have a job that was as wonderful, stimulating, fascinating, fulfilling. But I will never, ever have a family that is as wonderful either. And at some point, I had to make a choice. And it was, it was, a, it was a poignant choice, obviously because I love the job, but it was also because I had met millions and millions of Americans. I had not personally met them. I knew there were. I had met literally thousands of them 
who were struggling with trying to balance work and family themselves and who did not have the luxury that I had. They could not simply leave their job and know that there was a very high likelihood they could get another job paying pretty well. Uh, this is a deep-seated problem for so many people. People are working harder than ever in America. The economy is doing well, yes, but when we say we're doing well as an economy, we have to remember what Tonto asked the Lone Ranger, who is we, Kimosabi? Who is doing well? There are a lot of people still barely making ends meet. And there is a lot left to do, not only in Washington, but in our communities and our businesses, to make sure that everybody, everybody, has a fair chance of prospering and being a good parent if they're willing to work hard in this economy. I learned a lot. I'm looking forward to talking and sharing my views with you. And it is wonderful, wonderful to be home. Thank you. Thanks very much. What a delight. It's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, the Honorable Alan Simpson, who also has earned that title. And uh, as you may know, he served for 18 years in the United States Senate for the ill numerate. That's three terms. He played a very prominent role in many, many issues over those years, including the Clean Air Act, immigration policy, and entitlements reform. He served on a number of very powerful committees, including the Finance Committee. And he was a member of the Republican leadership, one of the very few uh, individuals who had real leadership uh, position and power. Uh, he did that for 10 years. Uh, our paths actually crossed more in Washington than did my path with the, the Democrat secretary, even though I was a Democrat. And we ended up negotiating on uh, things like uh, the allocation of credits under the uh, SO2 program of the Clean Air Act, or the argument over whether EPA or the NRC ought to regulate radionuclides uh, in this country. Uh, on many issues, we did not always agree, but I came to appreciate his extraordinary candor, his wit, his willingness to take tough stands, his willingness to be pugnacious for the things that he believed in, and yet an extraordinary capacity to work with other people to get things done because he was truly a legislator which meant he understood there was a time to make decisions and there was a need for decisions and you had to work with other people to do that. Currently, of course, he's here with us at the Kennedy School for this semester. As a member of the faculty, he's a visiting lecturer holding the Lombard Chair at the Joan Shorenstein Center on Press and Politics, though we at the IOP have done our best to get him over to our events and do together with our uh, students as well. When he left the Senate to uh, come here. He, there, of course, was a, a quite a bit of celebration in Washington, not because he was leaving, but to celebrate his service there. And in that celebration, uh, one event was a roast by his colleagues, at which Senator Kennedy uh, identified and indicated that uh, he chided our speaker, I should say, uh, for the many times that Senator Simpson over the years had characterized himself as the lonely cowboy longing to return to his beloved Wyoming. Kennedy said, and the first thing he does is go to Harvard and Cambridge when he's out of office, <laughs> a place that some of his conservative brethren have assailed as Kremlin on the Charles. <laughs> but if there were an election, Senator, to determine whether or not you should stay here in the Kennedy School community, uh, I have no doubt the motion would win hands down for you to stay. You and your wife, Anne, have done an extraordinary job of throwing yourselves into the activities here, making yourselves available to an extraordinary range of students and other activities here. And I hear endless praise uh, for that activity and your engagement here. But I do have to tell you that if the contest were between whether you stay or your wife, Anne, stays, I'd hate to place my money and my bets on your victory. <laughs> this gentleman, too, is an author. His book is entitled, Right in the Old Gazoo. Now, I'm a Hoosier from Indiana. I think I know what that means. 
But Senator, for this highfalutin audience, you might want to explain that. Um, we're delighted, very delighted to have him with us tonight on the program. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Alan Simpson. Thank you. Uh, Phil, thank you. Uh, indeed, we did work together, and you know the rich admiration and regard that I've always had for you coming from that activity, conference committees, sitting through the dead, dry work of, of legislating, because legislating, if done correctly, is very dry work. There's nothing romantic about it. So, Phil, it's been a treat, and when Marv Calv wandered into town a month after I would said I was going to retire and said this was a prospect, I said, oh, my, wait a minute. And it has been a wonderful, wonderful adventure and a great honor and a privilege, and Ann and I have loved it, and we live over in Elliott House on the second floor. We know some rest over there. Um, but they seem to stay up till 3, 4, 5 in the morning. I don't know what the hell they do over there. <laughs> and they look across to the Kennedy School or the graduate school over there, and they say, well, their lights are on over there, so we should do that. It's kind of a ghastly contest. I don't understand it. <laughs> Nevertheless, now, uh, Robert and I never shared what we were going to say tonight. We were given 10 minutes. He went far, far over that. <laughs> and I'm going to try now to pick up the slack and try to get the program righted. Uh, and, and he flacked his book in a shameless way without any <laughs> question, uh, holding it up, pretending that there was this thing about the title. He knew what the hell <laughs> the title is. Robert Reich, huge. Then this, this picture. Genial. Oh, well, anyway, now. <laughs> My book is entitled, no. <laughs> now, but Reich and I are not here to flog our books, although we will do so given half a chance at any particular occasion. I thought the title of your remark should be called Run Amok. <laughs> not bad. I mean, we can use it somewhere. <laughs> Rather incongruous pair, no question about that. Uh, here we are, a right to work state Republican uh, from Wyoming, uh, a death to corporate America Democrat from, <laughs> from, from Massachusetts, uh, unions forever, <laughs> and, uh, and here we are. Uh, we met in Washington. The first day we met, I'd never seen Robert Reich before in my life, and we were at a huge, one of those huge, ghastly Washington black tie dinners, where you try to snatch the 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 you know the celebrity of the day, and they bring people you've never seen. They have nothing to do with government, but they've been on the news, and you know I've seen some really spooky people at that. So I'm walking, there's nothing to do when you're walking along, you've never met a person, and you're six, seven, and you meet a person, four, ten. You just, you, you have two choices there. You can, you know, and he, too, and you look and you think, well. But he looked up and he said, what the hell, you, you must be Simpson. I said, you must be Reich. And so he grabbed a chair, grabbed a chair from a well-appointed table and jumped up on it. And he said, now we're going to talk eye to eye. <laughs> and then he called for a photographer to come by and recorded the act, and they've never sent us the picture. And they said they would, but there are many things in Washington like that. Where they... <laughs> then we met at the arena stage, and we did the arena stage, but the director finally gave up on us because we would sit in the back. There is a mischief mischievous gr grin, which is playing about his lips now, and, and mine. We were, it's something in our childhood we've shared some thoughts about, but mischievous. He said, why don't we just go out and just do this little skit? We'll just add our own little thing to this. And so we did. Well, the director was in shock, but everybody laughed. So once we get into it and begin to ham up, we can't stop. And our wives, Claire and Anna said, now look, neither of you, don't try to be funny because you're funny enough <laughs> without trying to be funny. So we guard against that. 
and have, and then we'd have lunch together. And my staff would say, why are you going over and have lunch with Robert Reich? And I'm sure his staff had the same views. And we'd say, well, because we like each other. We enjoy just sitting down telling terrible stories and laughing. And so we would do that and laugh and eat modest, modest, in fact, penurious presentations at his office. Just, you know, <laughs> chips and half a tuna sandwich. <laughs> Obviously, the capacity of both of us physically is quite different. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we got through that. But the common thread is humor. And humor, all humor comes from pain. There is no one with a great sense of humor unless you have had pain. Pain becomes your shield and your sword and it becomes your insulation. And uh, Robert and I have shared that. The person that told me that was Danny Kay, the great, the great comedian. I met him years ago, and he came to Wyoming, conducted the Grand Teton Symphony with his, he broke 52 batons, you know, he loved that act. He said, growing up in New York as a son of uh, Russian Jews uh, who could not speak the language and just shuffling around in the streets of, of New York was not a pleasant experience. And he said, that's where I learned humor. I'm sure that Robert Reich learned humor. Uh, Al Simpson was 6'7", weighed 200 and some pounds in the eighth grade and, and uh, knocked me and zits all over me. That's when you learn humor. I couldn't outrun anybody. So you learn humor, you learn how to out-talk them and out-josh them, and it works. My mother taught me that humor is the universal solvent against the abrasive elements of life. That's what humor is, and it surely is. Well, just quickly, um, the book tour, now again, now listen to this, because we never checked, we knew what we were doing, but the book tour is a demeaning, ghastly thing. You've heard it reported. You go to these places, cities all over America, and they say, at 7.05 this morning, you're going to go on what is best described as the poor man's version of the Today Show from whatever community you're in. And there are smiling people, beautifully coiffed, uh, men and women, their eyelids just as perky as can be, all of them redone. <laughs> uh, and you're there looking like the sea hag because they put you to bed at 10.30 or 11 or 12, they rose you from your fetid pad and dragged you out into the Oakland uh, television station, which is 45 minutes from here, and we must be there. And you get there, and nothing happens for an hour. <laughs> and then you come on, and, and it all is over in two minutes. And then somebody grabs you and takes you somewhere else. Uh, Peter, our lovely friend Peter Gomes, was at this podium several days ago and spoke about how ghastly it is. But of course, his book has sold more books than all the books ever written at Harvard. <laughs> and Reich and I are, well, he's not in his second printing, but I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, Peter said he was on this show, and the, and the announcer said, and now the Reverend Peter Gomez will speak to us. He said, no, no, my name is Gomes. Well, Mr. Gomez, you get right on and speak. And they just threw him into the maw. The worst one, and I'm sure you that I'm going to stop, was David McCullough, our friend, who was flogging his book, Truman. And he went to Seattle, I believe it was, and here was met by a marvelous young man, about 34, who was obviously the toast of the town on his morning program. And he visited with David McCullough, and he said, tell us about Mr. Truman, uh, Truman, Truman, you're right here on Truman. Uh, I thought that was the name, <laughs> thinking it was not Calvin Coolidge. And he said, yes, yes, I, and, and what, tell us about, yes, the atomic bomb, that must have been a terrible decision for Mr. Truman. Well, David said it was a very dramatic decision. It ranks right in there with the, with the uh, remarkable um, oh, experience and the, and the tremendous importance of Normandy Beach. Well, he said he th thought he saw a little fleck uh, overcome this eye, uh, this one, you know, eye, unblinking eye of the reporter. And uh, 
So just as they were ready to go on, he said, now, okay, thanks, it's been fun, and have another Danish, and now if we could talk about Truman, and maybe you could tell the folks a little more about this guy, Norman D. Beach. <laughs> and David said, well, uh, sit down again, <laughs> as only David could, and cheered the poor fellow and brought him forward from the wilderness. That's what goes on out there. And of course, the best one for me is, and you must learn to laugh at yourself. That's, you know, here he is, here's Robert telling you these things. You must learn to laugh at yourself. You don't have to, unless you want to cry yourself to sleep at night, then you can chuckle and be very serious about yourself. But the best one, the one that fulfilled every, every promise was in Cheyenne, and Ann, oh, a lot of people voted for Ann through the years. In fact, they would come up and say, I wouldn't vote for you, you fool, you idiot. But I'd vote for her. I'd say, well, fine, that's all right. But her name is not on the ballot. Therefore, <laughs> you can put my name on the ballot. And anyway, here, and Ann said, they're over that couple over there by the window. They recognize you when we go by. So I went by, and Ann was with me, and there's this couple. A man kind of sunk down a little. And I said, how are you? Nice to see you this evening. I'm uh, good to see you. And they said, yeah, good to see you too. I said, uh, well, uh, nice evening, and... Uh, how are you tonight? And, and this woman just said, and the man, they both said, look, we don't, you don't know who the hell we are. And you don't care, you just wander over here, you're all alike. You don't even know who we are, do you, Malcolm? <laughs> the other U.S. Senator from Wyoming, <laughs> Yale man, Malcolm Wallop. And I said, I've been waiting for you for a lifetime. You don't know who the hell I am. I'm Al Simpson. Well. <laughs> Then they both sunk into their respective seats. <laughs> Three other things. You've heard the phrase in politics, don't get mad, get even, forget it. All you get out of that is gas, ulcers, and heartburn. <laughs> Anybody that tells you you want to keep score, stay away from them. It won't get you a nickel, won't buy lunch. All of the important decisions of life are based on insufficient data. Every single one. And boy, I see people around here who must post it on the bathroom mirror. Forget it. You ain't ever going to get it. All, all of the most vital decisions of your life will be based on insufficient data. And if you don't know who you are before you get to Washington, it's the poorest possible place to find out. You will never, never find out. And so, sharing those things and remembering too that life is absurd in the most positive sense of the word. It is absurd. And that's what makes it fun. And uh, that's why I enjoy uh, Bob Reich. We have fun. It's childish sometimes, but it's fun. But that's great too. And, and my great uncle had this phrase, and when you said it, I nearly collapsed. He always said, ah, the perversity of inanimate objects. Because it was always a toaster he was trying to kick. He said, it's not even alive, and I want to kill it. <laughs> and, and so it is. And then the final admonition, get out before they throw you out. A very important point. And then the final message from Edmund Burke. A little heavy, a little bit elite, but Burke was that way. <laughs> those, ah, this one, Robert, those who would carry the great public schemes must be proof against the most fatiguing delays, the most mortifying disappointments, the most shocking insults, and the worst of all, the presumptuous judgment of the ignorant beyond their design. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's been fun, and uh, what a great treat to be here, and uh, I finished my 11th week giving them a vast array of my own resources and remarkable visiting lecturers. <laughs>
And the first focus of the project was to examine the question about why so much public cynicism, why the increase in distrust in government, what are the factors that contribute to that? And uh, I think it's safe to say the two gentlemen here are not contributing factors. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to ask each of them to do is just uh, take a couple moments to sort of assess uh, where we are, why they think this is a problem, and, and give us some, a little of their insight into the issue of public cynicism and distrust. Uh, Phil, there is one school that contends that the cynicism comes from a sequence of events beginning, perhaps with Watergate going through, or actually Vietnam, Watergate, uh, Iran-Contra, uh, savings and loan, and so forth. I don't really believe that. I think that the cynicism we have now is really not new. Uh, what was new was a period of time between approximately 1932 and 1990 something, in which we suspended our typical normal cynicism as a nation, the cynicism that we were born with as a nation. And because we were all facing common threats, a depression, a hot war, a cold war, and so forth, we allowed ourselves to suspend our disbelief and perhaps invest more than we as a nation ever did invest psychologically in government and in our leadership. Without that sense of common challenge, we revert. We revert to type, we revert to form, we revert to what our normal pattern has been, what our heritage is. And this is a nation born, I want to repeat and stay this, and in, in, kind of underscore this, born in cynicism about government, distrust of government, dislike of government. Uh, that is deep in the American soul. And probably all of these factors, that is Vietnam and Watergate and Iran-Contra and everything else, contributed to it, but that is not the central issue. Uh, even Japan is no longer our competitive threat any longer. And you ask today, why do we, what is the social glue holding us together? What is it that characterizes our willingness to defer to government? Why should we, why do we? And people have a very hard time coming up with a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, you knew I would get to this. So <laughs> I, I have a view uh, that a lot of this of the present time comes from the media. I believe the media is interested only, only in conflict, controversy, and confusion. They are not interested in clarity in any way. They don't express it, at least, in any way. And, and I cite a classic example. My last years or months, two years, 18 months in the U.S. Senate, all you read about was gridlock. You didn't read about anything but gridlock. And you know what we did in a bipartisan way in the last 18 months before I left? We did unfunded mandates. It may not mean anything to you, but for God's sake it should. It means that if we pass a, a bill saying that you have to get asbestos out of all the schools, that you figure how to pay for it at the federal level instead of busting half the school districts in America and having them go do uh, bond issues and take away from education and asbestos, ladies and gentlemen, for my age was something we just in the basement of every school that we drew our names in and pulled off and threw around and hurled at the teacher and wadded balls, but we're still here. Uh, now don't throw anything, that often happens in my line of work. <laughs> Unfunded mandates, no more of them. We did line item veto, I've heard people talking about that for 10 years. We did lobbying reform. We really cut them, chopped them up. Congressional compliance, made ourselves comply with the same laws we don't do with business. We did that. Did an anti-terrorism bill, which is so tough and so strong, it may even impinge on civil liberties. We did health care in an incremental way with Kassebaum and Kennedy. We did food safety with the Delaney Clause, hadn't been dealt with for years, finally did it. Welfare reform, you may not like it, but everybody knew what had been done before was a failure and that we had to do something. We did a farm bill for the first time in history. We dinged them on the support system. It used to be if you wanted to make more money in corn in Iowa, you just put up a second mailbox. And uh, that's another story, but we corrected that. A telecommunications bill, we did that. Sweeping. 
and an illegal immigration bill, and all you heard was blah, 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 blah. Now I'll tell you, that's where I'm coming from, and, and that's got to change. Let me, uh, if I may, respectfully disagree, Senator. Uh, uh, disagree just in, in one respect. Certainly the media are cynical, and I've suffered through just the last four years of what you suffered through. But historically, the media in this country in the 19th century were even worse and distorting, and, and they were, you know, you couldn't get even stories through the media. I think, again, what may have changed, going back to, back to this notion of, of a special time in our history, from the 30s to maybe the early 90s or 80s, uh, the media reflecting the public, and I think the media does reflect public sentiment, uh, the media were willing to suspend a certain disbelief. Uh, but let me add one, one other thing that I left out. I think that we cannot ignore the fact that median wages, and in fact the wages for a tremendous section of the workforce, particularly people without college degrees, have been declining for 20 years, and that has bred a great deal of anger and resentment. And there is a lot of cynicism out there about everything, about every institution in society, and looking for scapegoats, looking for lightning rods. I think the media reflects that anger and that cynicism. I can't resist having been there to also argue two additional points. Obviously, the behavior of some individuals in public office clearly contributes to disappointment. Uh, among the American public. I don't think there's any question about that. And I think the second thing is I think there's a broader uh, worry. I think sometimes it's, uh, there's a lot of misinformation about uh, the generalized performance of government and government policies. So often we hype them so large in order to get them accepted to begin with that, that they are bound to be a disappointment in terms of the performance when it comes about. And sometimes we fail to give the sufficient resources to make the policy work. And sometimes we've obviously picked lousy policy so that I think that the innate, the long-term cultural cynicism has been contributed to by, by issues of performance as well, it seems to me. Let me say too, Phil, I think that you, you look at things that are happening, uh, like the Food Lion case, which has suddenly gotten people focused, and then the other lawsuits, they're there. The point uh, that I like to make is, look, there are some real jerks in Congress, and, and I get blamed for every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some real jerks in the media, and wonderful people in the media get blamed for all of them. That's what this, that's called perception, and that's something none of us in public life ever escaped. That's the worst one. You know, we know who you are. You, you're all the same, all the same. And that's a tough one to get around, because they're, they, they stay on the front pages for weeks, the jerks. Well, I was going to ask, but there we're going to turn to our audience here. I was going to ask our, uh, both of our colleagues on that note to actually identify jerks? some positive jerks. examples. Oh, No, sorry. not the jerks. <laughs> <laughs> they for, they forever make the front page. <laughs> the point is to identify some of the folks that they would consider are, uh, are, have done acts of courage or acts of wisdom or just exercised good sense and done a good job. But uh, maybe that will come out in their answers to some of our uh, audience here. So let's turn to our audience. We'd ask everybody, if they would, to come to our microphones. We have two on the first floor here. And please identify yourselves and briefly ask a question. And uh, we'll give both of our uh, panelists an opportunity to uh, answer unless you pointedly make it for one only. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jared Genzer. I'm a first-year uh, master's student at the Kennedy School. Um, thank you all for being here this evening. The question that I have is actually kind of more of a probing question, which is that many of my friends here who are in the master's program, um, we share a, a deep concern about a desire to go into public service, but at the same time a desire to have a family and a desire to be able to have a personal life at the same time. And uh, obviously, you know, Mr. Secretary, uh, you, I, I personally greatly respected the decision that you made when you decided to uh, return to your family, that it, you had done the service that you wanted to do for the time and you wanted to move on to do something else. But I guess the question that I have is, what advice would you have for those of us who are interested in going into careers in public service, but also want to be able to maintain that balance? Because increasingly, the norm and the expectation is the 16-hour workday, particularly if you're going to go to Washington or if you're going to want to make a difference on real significant policy issues? I would tell you, first of all, if you were over at the business school or at their law school contemplating either a business career or a law career, you would face exactly the same issue. And don't think for a minute the government is any different. 
If you are on a fast track, a professional track, if you think that you are going to, to make it big, you are going to be asked and expected to work your fanny off. And that's going to put enormous pressure on your family responsibilities. A lot of people are deferring having families because of that. But there is something different, I think, qualitatively about a high level of government service. And I'm not talking about the first 15 or 20 years of any high-pressure career. I'm talking about being a senator or a cabinet member or uh, a, uh, a, a state official. Because of the difficulty, the inherent difficulty of measuring success, because so much is indeterminate and because so many pressures are coming at you so many, in so many directions, so many ways, it is very necessary to draw limits, to set some limits with yourself. Uh, these are the kinds of jobs that can be obsessive, compulsive. The motor doesn't stop running if you don't control it. Now, I felt uh, that I had to leave in large part, ironically, because I loved the job too much. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people in this country who, if they pulled in their belts somewhat, uh, maybe simplified their lives, uh, they would have more time for their families. They're not in love with their jobs. The most dangerous, insidious condition occurs when you are absolutely crazy about your job then balance is very, very hard. You can't get more of a job and more of your family. There aren't that many hours. Thank you. Well, I, I tell you, if, if you don't have a supportive spouse in this game, you don't want to get in this game. Now, this is where you come home at night with, and, and your staff has given you a bale of stuff that would choke a horse, and you've been <laughs> at it all day long, and here's this stack, and you look at it, Oh, and then there's little things they slip in, you know, they're about 80 pages. It says, maybe over the weekend uh, you'll, you'll enjoy this. <laughs> I never saw anything that I enjoyed, any, any one of them. Uh, you'll like this. This is a dazzler. Uh, and, and then, of course, we had the Senator Ted Stevens syndrome, which was that as he left for Alaska after just exhausted week, an exhausting week, he opened his pouch, and here was this huge thing that said, you'll like this one, Senator. It's something you'll want to see before you get home. And he opened it up, and it was a book, but it hadn't been opened yet. It, hadn't, did, it didn't have the cuts on the pages. It was still stuck together. And he called back at the first stop and fired that person in an <laughs> instant. He said, you didn't even read it, and you dumped it on me to impress me and your history. Well, that, we all remember that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you have to tell people uh, that I loved, I loved the job, too. I was babbling one day, and Arnie Arneson over here came up, buttonholed me, said, you forgot to tell them that we were legislators, and we loved the work. And boy, I loved it. I, 31 years of it, I loved it. I just didn't want to do it anymore. And when Robert and I were having lunch, and I said, how old are your boys? And he said, 12 or 14, whatever they were then. I said, pal, uh, I can't tell you how many nights Ann and I said, we're going to set aside Saturday night, Al, because they're home. We know they're going to be, well, Saturday night came, hell, they were all boogieing around, and Ann and I are sitting there. I said, boy, this is great. But then maybe Thursday at noon, they'd both run in and just start chattering like magpies. you got to be there. And it's tough, uh, but uh, it's tough. It, it's, they're like a clam, but... Uh, it's, uh, I loved it, and you should too, if you're gonna do it. Yeah, uh, my name is John Frank, and I'm a first year student here at the Kennedy School, and I actually had the pleasure of meeting you, uh, Secretary Reich, at Stuyvesant High School uh, last year, where um, I was a teacher. Uh, tonight, you mentioned how it was so hard to get people around you that would criticize you. They were like the golden nuggets. And I'd like if you could uh, explain or expand a little bit about that, and also I'd like to hear uh, Senator Simpson's ideas on that. Uh, expanded in the sense of why that was the case? Uh, I mean, it's, it's very, it, Washington, <laughs> to some extent, like any one company town, it is a one company town. Everybody's either working for the company or against the company or lobbying the company or reporting on the company. It's the same company. But in any company town, uh, there are pecking orders and people, uh, there are a lot of sycophants. There are a lot of people who just want to uh, tell you how good you are. 
Uh, there are also people on the other side who will dump on you consistently, but not in a constructive and meaningful way. So you have to find truth tellers. Uh, now, there is a function to be performed. I, I don't mean that sycophancy is, is completely without function, because people in these kinds of jobs, whether it's, again, cabinet officer or senator or whatever, you are on all day. You need enormous confidence in what you are doing. And you need people to say, that was terrific, because you've got to then go from that meeting to this meeting to this television to this conference, and you've got to be on. Uh, you have to have confidence. But you've got to tell your staff, or you've got to find people around you, or you've got to tell friends, I desperately need and I will reward you in various ways, psychological and other ways, for telling me what I have done wrong, what I could do better, how I could do it better. Okay. And Senator Simpson, could you add to that? Well, uh, Bob used those phrases. I love one called the oleaginous creeps. <laughs> there are oleaginous creeps, like butter. They, you know, and they, oh, Senator, that's marvelous. You know, you're just, you're just, you're so funny. And <laughs> You're so witty, and I just and and so it's a cloying kind of feeling, and you can spot them. It's called, in the ancient vernacular, brown nosing. <laughs> and uh, you can see that Robert, in just 13 weeks together, has used the word crap. Uh, he did not use that word when I first knew him. <laughs> and uh, you have to tell your staff how you live. And you say, here's what Ann and I do. Here's when we get up in the morning, and here's what we like to do on weekends, and here's what we do. That's a very critically important thing to do. And then you have to have these people who are not fearful of their jobs, who will come in, and you know it's coming, just say, Al, I need to talk to you because uh, I just got something I got to say. And boy, you know what's coming. They'll say, you know, you're, you, you're too cocky. You're riding for a fall when that happened several times, uh, and you're full of yourself, and you've been on all the shows, and, and, and or, or in certain instances, I, I didn't know who you were in that issue, and you better listen. And, and sometimes, even though Anne was telling me that, uh, I wouldn't listen to her even, and then you have to have some, you have to have people around you who love you. And that's not being pathetic, because without family and friends, you don't want to get into politics. But this is also, if I may, a management issue. You've got to make it safe for people to be critical. Uh, mm -hmm. the, there is a natural tendency for people not to believe that you will really accept constructive criticism. Now, all of the forces are in the opposite direction. You've got to go out of your way to make it safe. Uh, there was one young woman uh, who worked for me uh, in the press office who was, uh, she couldn't have been more than 25, but occasionally she would come up to me, uh, particularly when we went around to some television things, she, and she would say after a particular three-minute television interview, she'd say, Mr. Secretary, you, that was really, that was not good. You did not do a good job. You, you used your hands too much. Uh, your sentences were much, much too long. It was very difficult to follow what you were saying. And she would always have very specific, very constructive, very useful things to say. And I was delighted. I was, uh, and I, I, I rewarded her in every way I could. I mean, I made it clear to her that I wanted more of that. But very few people are willing to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm Jim Tipton. Lives here and live here in Cambridge. Um, I have a question I'll direct at uh, you, Senator Simpson, first. But uh, before I do that, when uh, Robert Rice was mentioning his serious ten items. It made me think of uh, some years ago when I was in uh, Pakistan and had a meeting with the, uh, the uh, gentleman in the uh, Pakistani government who was in charge of, of uh, community development. And he had been in, um, at Michigan State previous to being the Secretary of Community Development and described him, his experiences there. And he went back to Pakistan with the idea of being a democratic public official. And he described his meetings with his own staff in which he was very much interested in hearing their thoughts. But he said, for many, many s sessions of that sort, I found them sitting on their fannies and waiting to hear what I was going to say. Anyway, it's hard to do what you were talking about to get this. Now, my question, 
Senator Simpson, is uh, interesting. It, uh, I take it from a quotation in the uh, Cambridge Chronicle this afternoon about uh, Robert Reich's book, from a quotation from Robert Reich's book. I'm delighted at the humor the two of you bring into your Friday night programs of this. But I would be interested in whether there's, a, that I'm sensing a possible difference between the two of you related to this. Reich says, my, uh, assuming the uh, chronicle is quoting him correctly, my real concern is that the deficit is already framing our discussions about what we want to accomplish in the future. Getting the deficit, quote, under control is becoming the most important measure of success. We are building a conceptual prison. The deficit has to be cut, surely, but the deficit isn't the core problem. The problem is that the earnings of half our workforce have been stagnant or declining for years, and there's no simple link between the deficit going up and wages going down. Do you agree with Bob Reich? <laughs> Did, did you say oh, that? <laughs> you said that? No. It's a wild, <laughs> frenzied moment. Uh, conceptual prison. I heard that. I, I, I preface this by saying, assuming the Chronicle quotes him correctly. <laughs> well, yes, it did. Yes, it did. <laughs> Robert Reich and I don't agree on a lot of things. Uh, and to me, the deficit is a sparrow belch in the middle of a, fi of a typhoon. But I'll tell you what's bigger for me, and I'm, they're trying to educate me, um, unless I get my banker to believe this, that we can grow our way out of debt. Now, Parker's heard this. I know he's going to rush in here and just claw on my back. Richard, I, God, I, anyway, I tell you, you can go ahead and balance the budget this year, I mean, seven years from now, and the debt today is $5.4 trillion, and after we have, quote, balanced the budget, the debt will be $6.4 trillion. And why? because there ain't a politician in America that will deal with Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and federal retirement. Now that's where we are. That's where I, I, was, on the, I was on the Entitlements Commission. And all I know is that 30 of the 32 of us, including Dale Bumpers, Tom Downey, uh, Pat Moynihan, Thad Cochran, agreed that if there is no increase in taxes, and if we do a perfect health care bill, then in the year 2012, there will only be enough revenue coming in to take care of Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, federal retirement, interest on the debt. There will be nothing, zip, for education, defense, transportation, you name it, WIC, WIN, Head Start, anything you or anyone in this room might like to have. And that's what 30 of the 32 of us believed and wrote and put after nine months, and the president ignored it totally, and the Republicans ignored it totally, and the Democrats ignored it totally. Denial is not uh, a river in Africa. As you know, I'm not surprised. <laughs> as, you, <laughs> as you know, let's, sir, let's, I'm, let's, let's, I'm not surprised that you answer. I'm curious now as to whether Bob would agree with you. <laughs> well, here, here again, I think uh, Alan and I have tried over the years to talk about the subtle nuances of an issue. For example, on the, bu on the budget, I agree completely that Medicare has got to be got under control. The long-term Medicare problem is enormous. Uh, the question is, who's going to bear the burden of getting Medicare under control? Uh, I think that there is a tremendous problem right now with the crunch that is occurring on domestic discretionary spending. There's almost nothing left. And I'm in 100% agreement with Alan that we've got to do something or else we're not going to have any money for education or training or roads or anything on the domestic discretionary side. Uh, I would place greater emphasis, and I'm much more concerned about two things. Number one, we fail in all our discussions of deficit and debt to differentiate between expenditures that are really spending on today, that are simply income transfers uh, like to wealthy farmers uh, on crop subsidies on the one hand, and investments in the future capacity of our people to be productive, uh, like education and training on the other. No sane business person would fail to make an investment in future productivity, even if it required going into debt to do that. But we somehow lump everything together. We have a completely meaningless discussion about 
a federal budget which is an accounting device. We don't do it right. We don't understand what is spending, what is, what is investing. And secondly, we do not look carefully enough at the allocative, the distributive consequences of what we are cutting and why we are cutting it. The poor are bearing the brunt of the deficit cuts in this country, not the rich. The poor are the ones who are bearing the, greater, the greatest burden of bringing the deficit down and balancing the budget. And I think that's given the increasing gap in earnings between the rich and poor already, even before you get to these kinds of transfers, to destroy our social safety net on the altar of balancing the budget is simply unwise for everyone. Thanks. Um, maybe you already answered my question, but uh, my name is Dion Fraser, and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, Secretary Reich, um, just before you entered office in uh, 1993, there was a general feeling in um, the media, um, they said on the part of the American public, that they felt that America was moving in the wrong direction, and I was just wondering if you thought that we were beginning to turn that around? Uh, well, s that's, a, that's a complicated question because, again, the pronoun we is a very complicated pronoun. Uh, if you look at polls, polls generally show a higher degree of confidence. The public is basically happier now, and it's not a surprise because the economy shows no sign of inflation, and we have relatively low unemployment, uh, certainly much lower than we had before. Uh, but there, as I said before, there's so many people who are barely making ends meet. Uh, more than one out of five of our children is in poverty in this country, the richest nation in history, richer than we've ever been in history. One out of five, more than one out of five of our children is in poverty. And we have now 44 million people without any health care. Five years ago, we had 39 million. In fact, 1992 was 39 million. Uh, in many ways, we're going in the right direction. In many ways, we, depending on who is we, are worse off than before. And we have to have, and I, I think the thing that worries me most of all is that we in this nation are not having constructive conversations in our political culture about who's winning, who's losing, how to help the people who are falling behind. We're just assuming, oh, everything's fine. One of the things that's always interesting to me uh, about the rich versus the poor, the eternal struggle, often fired by politicians, uh, is that uh, when you say, well, and the Republicans got into it with the tax cut for the rich, or that was what it was called, 15%, and it was to the rich. And I always threw out wherever they'd listen that it is a strange thing, but 1% of the taxpayers pay 30% of the taxes. 5% of the taxpayers pay 50.4% of the taxes. So if you give a tax cut, who the hell do you think is going to get the tax cut? It's going to be the people probably in the top 5% who pay 50.2% of the taxes. But I notice that with some in the other faith, not Robert, <laughs> that when we're trying to do something with affluence testing, and we're going to have to affluence test benefits. If you got 50, 60 grand coming in a year, you ain't going to get a COLA on your Social Security. You're going to get your benefit, but you're not going to get a cost of living allowance. And then somebody please help us with Part B premiums, where right now we have a situation where the richest people in America are paying only 25% of the premium on Part B Medicare, which is physician reimbursement and durable goods, and the people in the kitchen are paying the other 75%. Now that's what's happening in America today. Moynihan and I tried to correct that. Oh, I mean, get out of the way. Oh, I see what you're doing. Oh, people, bro. And they're the only country on earth that has fewer people paying taxes. I mean, this country has exempted from total taxation a huge reservoir of people who don't even pay a dollar in tax. I have a twisted view that if you're going to use the medical care system, you ought to put up five bucks a visit. And it would solve a lot of our problems, access problems. First lady at one time and I talked about that, Hillary Clinton, and both of us thought it was a good idea, and you can imagine that both of us got hammered flat. <laughs> got time for, I'm afraid, for just one more question here. Okay. Hello, my name is Cindy Ehrenberg, and I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. And uh, at the risk of 
being called a syncophant or some other horrible name, I'd like to tell you how much <laughs> I've enjoyed this evening and enjoyed uh, Senator Simpson, your class throughout the semester, and your work, Mr. Secretary, uh, throughout the last four years. My question goes back, and, and perhaps it's appropriate that this is the last one, because it goes back to where we started um, with Phil Sharp's question about the Visions and Governance Project. If I understood you correctly, um, I think you both agreed that there is a cynicism out there uh, in the public about public service. And I wonder if you see as a problem retaining and attracting good people to public service when you have this um, public cynicism out there. Um, I know I hear when I say that I want to go into public service, my friends and family say, are you crazy? Why would you want to do that? Uh, there's a, I get a lot of discouragement, and I wondered what each of you thought. Well, I, it would be easier 10 weeks ago to say that's true, but, but Anne did my class one day, as you know, and the students asked for that, and they gave her a standing ovation, which was a shocking and painful thing. <laughs> uh, but what she said were a couple of things like, uh, she said, now wait a minute, don't forget, they like you to know that they're suffering. Very important that you know they're suffering, and suffering for you. And, and, and we do that. So we'll throw up the stuff and say, well, we do this, and nobody appreciates it. And, and there's some truth to that. Uh, but uh, the people I've met in my tour of duty here who are thinking of going into public life are inspirational. I see them. They're going to go ahead. The only one you really have to worry about is if you've got a lot of turkeys in your cage and a lot of little red wagons in the, in the old shop, you better let them out. Better lay them right out there early on. And, and then people don't mind because they have so many flaws themselves. Uh, uh, just say, I did this when I was 18, and they go, oh, can't believe it. Well, tell them, and then move on. Just say, but I'm now 50, or I'm 47, so it doesn't make a difference. Are we going to keep score? Very important, I think that's the part they get in, and then they get into the negative campaigning. That goes with it. You're entitled to be called a fool, a boob, a poop, all those things, but you're not entitled to have a distortion of who you are. And until people who go into politics learn the ultimate the ultimate uh, uh, theorem, I believe. What was it in algebra they tried to pump in? Us? Axioms, whatever, though. No, no, don't ask. <laughs> it, it is, uh, you don't know. You I can't help me. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. It, it, no, what the hell, I got carried away there and got smart ass <laughs> and missed it. Uh, uh, well. It's passed from my consciousness. <laughs> but it was, it was wonderful. It'll come to me at about 2 this morning. <laughs> I'll be coming to see you next week. You can tell me. I, I will. I will. It'll come before, well, it's nearly over. Yeah. You can answer now. Oh, but. thank you. <laughs> uh, I am concerned about attracting people to public service. Uh, I have talked to a lot of young people, and I've talked to many people who are middle-aged, uh, some in the private sector. And they are discouraged. They say, why should I put up with that? Why should I go into politics? Why should I go into public administration? Why should I seek or accept an appointment in the executive branch? And I tell them from the bottom of my heart what I will tell you, and that is that these jobs are still, for all of their frustrations, for all of the shots that are taken and slaps that are administered, these are the most exhilarating, meaningful, wonderful jobs you can imagine. And it is in the public service, acting in the public service is the noblest calling of them all. Let me, I, I remembered, so I just quickly, it's very clear and it's the tough one. A, an attack unanswered is an attack believed. And if you get into politics, and somebody says something absolutely outrageous about you, the people who are telling you not to respond to that are the people that love you the most. Your spouse, your friends, they're saying, don't respond to Al because nobody believes that. And ladies and gentlemen, everybody believes anything that they say about you any, if you don't respond. And so they say, it's so outrageous. I mean, who would believe it? The more outrageous, the more they'll believe. And the more you don't respond, they lock in the belief. 
And finally, I learned how to get around that. It was very painful. Ann would say, you're not going to get down on their level, are you? And I'd say, you bet. <laughs> and then she'd say, well, I think you demean yourself. You lessen yourself. And that hurt. And then my chief of staff, wonderful guy, could tell me a lot of things. He'd say, you're just going to hurt yourself. You know, why do you want to do it? You're just, you're obsessed. And finally, I came to the soothing emollient, that's my name, not yours. That is a distortion of me, Alan Simpson, and it's rotten, and I don't like it, and I'm not going to stand for it. And that's when you either get in the game or get out of the game. And I never lost an election because I took them on in their lair, and I, and I was entitled to be called everything, and I was called everything. But it's when they distorted who I was, or printed something about me that was not true, I responded and always did. I wrote letters to the editor. They say, you're not going to do that. I say, yeah, I love writing letters. <laughs> I composed them myself. They're a marvelous letter. Very important thing. It's my name. Nobody else's. <clears throat> Me. If I could just add to your question, I think this is a temporary phenomenon. While I think it will always be with us and should be with us that people are quite skeptical about their politicians and their government and expect a great deal of them, I think the truth is that people recognize they want and need at government offices at all level competence and effectiveness, and so they're going to demand it. And I think also many people find in the private sector, while there are many exciting and valuable and contributory things to do, that in fact they are not totally fulfilled and they wish to somehow participate either full-time or part-time in the public sector, in the decisions of the community. After all, Aristotle believed that we never had a full sense of self-fulfillment unless we were a part of making the community decisions. That doesn't have to be a full-time career, but it does mean a part of our lives may well need to be in the broader community to do that. So I think that we will see this situation turn around. But I want to thank very much our, uh, our two speakers tonight. <laughs>